Hi, this is uh, Dr. Aftab Mehmed. I'm leader of Biosafety Working Group. And uh, I'm going to talk today about personal protective equipment, PPEs. This is very important. Uh, whether you are working in a molecular biology laboratory or a microbiology laboratory, or you are working in a chemical laboratory, uh, it's very important to know about the personal protective equipment that what equipment are needed, how you have to don it and how you have to drop it. Joining and doffing is also very important and it needs practice. If you are like doing the practice, then you can do it uh, very easily. In addition, it's also very important that you have a proper understanding that what PPEs are required in particular experiment you are going to perform. For example, if you are working in a molecular biology laboratory or if you are working in area of uh, microbiology, then often we have to prepare uh, the buffer solution. And in buffer solution, we have to prepare a solution of uh, S SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate. That's a very common, commonly used uh, buffer reagent that we have to make. And sometimes, like it's, it's a common practice that uh, if you have to prepare a solution of SDS, uh, we often take it and then we wait and then prepare the solution. Uh, if you look very carefully at the literature of this chemical, uh, when we wait, then fine particles also come into the air and it go into our respiratory system and it, it can cause inflammation of the lungs and the respiratory system. So even very uh, like the chemical that we are commonly used, sometimes they could be dangerous. In addition, when we prepare, for example, the gel, like the protein gel we often prepare in our uh, molecular biology experiments, we often prepare uh, like use different chemicals and those chemicals even could be carcinogenic. So this is very important that we should learn that what, what are the risks. So whatever experiment you are going to perform is very important that you should calculate the risk and you should uh, have all the PPEs according to the, to minimize the risk involved in those experimentation. So in this lecture, we will talk briefly about uh, the importance of personal protective equipment and what personal protective equipment we need in different experiments. So we are going to start. So first thing is, uh, it's our responsibility. So it's your responsibility to protect your exposed skin eyes, ears, digestive and respiratory system by using the appropriate PPE. So we have to decide that what, what PPEs could be important for ourselves. In most of the 12 countries, uh, like I have done the experimentation in United States and in Japan and few other countries. So whenever you are in any 12 countries, so before starting the experimentation, it's important that you should go through a course about uh, the uh, like biosafety related courses, uh, the, the very basic courses and about the personal protective equipment. And sometimes uh, if you need some specific experimentation, you have to go through some specific courses. For example, if you have to go through the experiment about the blood bond pathogens, then you have to go through a specific course about the blood bond pathogens. Or if you are going to do some animal work, then you have to go through uh, a course about the animal handling and then you could start your work. So in most of the 12 countries, whenever you are going to start the work in the laboratory, the biosafety course is very important and you have to go through that course. You have to pass it and then you start the experimentation. But in most of the developing countries, it's not the scenario. So mostly we go to the laboratory, uh, there is some basic training sometimes, but now there is a more focus about uh, the biosafety training. It was not that much focus initially, but now it's very much focused in most of the developing countries as well that you should learn about the biosafety and then you can perform the experiments in the laboratory. So it's, it's our responsibility that we should know about the basics of biosafety before starting the experimental work in the laboratory and uh, to protect ourselves. So biosafety, I often give the definition that is uh, actually all the measures, all the protective equipments, the laboratory design, all the measures that we take uh, to protect ourselves, to protect our colleagues, uh, to protect our family, and to protect the environment. So when we protect ourselves from the biological hazards, we protect our colleagues, we protect our family, and we protect the environment from the biological hazards is the biosafety. So, uh, it's very important that we should learn the best practices before starting the laboratory work. So it's our responsibility to first 
understand and to protect ourselves and all the uh, people who are involved with us. So what are the PPEs? Uh, this is very important that we should choose the appropriate clothing to wear underneath the lab coat or disposable gown. And then wearing the correct shoes for work in a research laboratory, we will discuss in detail. Uh, in addition, we should restrict the use of cosmetics in the laboratory. Uh, we should wear the lab coat properly. Uh, we should wear the right gloves for the right job. We'll discuss this in detail as well. And then we should choose appropriate eye protection. This is also very important that we should have proper eye protection and we'll, uh, we will also discuss in detail. And then we have to use the correct respiratory protection and also the hearing protection. So actually what we have to do, we have to protect ourselves. What is exposed in those uh, kind of experiments? For example, our whole skin is exposed. So we have to protect our skin. Our respiratory system could be an exposure to some microbiological work or the chemical work. So we have to protect our respiratory system. We have to protect our digestive system. We shouldn't eat anything like sometimes we store the eatable in the laboratory uh, that's also totally prohibitory we shouldn't store the laboratory uh, the eatable in the laboratories in the laboratory fridge so it should be clearly written in the laboratory that this is only for the chemicals no uh, eatable should be in the laboratory fridge or and so on and we shouldn't eat anything in the laboratory so this is important that we should learn that th these are the safe practices that we should do while working in the laboratory. So we, uh, so I, we have to uh, protect our digestive system, we have to protect our eyes, we have to protect our hearing, ears, and so on. So how we can do that, we'll discuss in the coming slides. So first we discuss about the pants and shoes, what type of pants we should wear and what type of shoes we, we should wear. You should wear long pants and shoes uh, that should enclose your feet. Uh, they, these will act as a barriers of protection between you and the hazard. However, long pants shouldn't drag the floor. They can pick up particles with contaminants and spread them across the floor. They can also absorb possible contaminated liquid left on the floor. So this is very important that uh, it shouldn't be like shorts in the laboratory that our skin is exposed and it shouldn't be too long uh, that it should drag everything that is present on the floor. About the shoes, we shouldn't put on sandals, flip-flops, and open-toed or open-heeled shoes. Uh, they shouldn't be worn in the lavatory when working, uh, especially when working around the hazards. The canvas shoes may absorb liquids and are not advised. So they, they can also like, the liquid can be uh, poured onto them and they can absorb that. So we shouldn't use that as well. So closed shoes, they are normally recommended in the laboratory that we should have the closed shoes, not the open one, because open one uh, increase the exposure uh, uh, in, the, in the laboratory. To avoid steals, contamination, falling objects, and broken bone, wear uh, shoes that completely enclose your feet. Yes, even the heels. The thickness of the shoe depends on the type of work you are going to perform. So this is uh, what I have mentioned in the very start that we have to calculate the risk initially that what kind of experiments we are going to do. And accordingly, we have to put on all the personal protective equipment. And uh, we are discussing about the pants and shoes that we should have in, in the laboratory. So th this is uh, also important to learn that accidents do happen even in the developed countries. Uh, I was working in the United States back in 2008 and this, uh, this happened, I was also working in California and there was a uh, girl, uh, uh, her name was Shahar Bono and she was just 23 years old. She was a student at UCLA, University of uh, California, Los Angeles. She was transferring a couple of ounces of tertiary butyl lithium, which is very inflammable compound, uh, using a syringe uh, on December 29, 2008. When the plunger either ejected or was pulled out, a small amount of the hazardous chemical splashed onto her and as it was very uh, hazardous and it, is, it was very inflammable, so it caught fire and she got uh, second degree and third degree burn and she died after after a few days. So the accident do happen even in, in the laboratory. So that's why we should prepare ourselves that 
uh, we should uh, know all the precautionary measures that will how we have to handle these sort of chemicals. As we mentioned in the very start, that even uh, the protein gel that we commonly prepare in, the, uh, in our laboratory, the compound in that is a carcinogenic compound. So we have to handle it very carefully while working in the laboratory. So accidents do happen. I am going to uh, describe another uh, accident that happened in November 2007. A UCLA graduate student working as a paid researcher suffered first and second degree burns on his hand and chest. And the ethanol he was handling splashed on his clothing and hand and was ignited by a Bunsen burner. And so what happened? So uh, actually uh, on, on this day, the injured employee was wearing a polyester shirt over a cotton shirt. And the report it noted that the polyester material melted, resulting in a serious burn injuries on the applies chest. So this do happen that we should like, it's, it's a common practice uh, if you're working in a microbiology laboratory that we have to use the ethanol to clean the things and we are working very close to the Benson burner. So, and it, it's like, I, I know so many, uh, these kind of experiments even in Pakistan, while students were working close to the Benson burner, and you, they were using the ethanol and is suddenly there was a fire and then we have to rush to rescue the person. So this, this is the thing that can happen. So that's why we should prepare ourselves that part, part, personal protective equipment we have to wear. And also how we have to handle these chemicals carefully. So there should be, there, there will be another lecture on another course on the chemical safety and we'll discuss that how we have to handle the chemicals properly. So we, it's, it's important that we should wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. There are so many different types of personal protective, even, even the uh, gown that we have to wear. Uh, there are different colors that indicate that what kind of job you are going to do. That there are different types of respirators. There are different uh, type of masks that we, we can wear. So it it's very much depends on what kind of experiments you are going to perform. And accordingly, you have to choose it that what you are going to do. Uh, I often like mention in my, during my lectures that uh, if you have to like, if you have to work in the biosafety level one laboratory, uh, you should, there is a need of just uh, gloves and, and the lab coat that you can wear in that laboratory and you can perform your experiments. And if you have to work in a biosafety level three laboratory, then you can't do the same thing like a coat and, and the gloves, they are not enough for you. You have to take extra measures while working in a biosafety level three or biosafety four laboratory. They have a different requirement. So, and vice versa, if you are like, if you have to work in a biosafety level one laboratory and you are taking all the precautionary measures, like you have a gown, you have a respirator, or you are going to wear an N95 mask and the glasses and so on and the hearing protection everything that's not necessary in in biosafety level one so you have to like see what are hazards in your experiments and in what level you are working like either you are working in a biosafety level laboratory one biosafety laboratory two in the level two in level three or level four and accordingly there are personal protective equipments and also the personal protective equipments TPs are also according to the experiments you are going to perform. So you have to manage the things accordingly. And what are the absolute basic requirements for working in the laboratory? Uh, the basic requirements are the button lab coat or properly tied gown. So this is, all, this is very important. And you have seen while working in anywhere in the world that the researchers while working in the laboratory, they have a lab coat or a gown they are wearing and the gloves uh, while performing, performing the experiments, like if you are doing the microbiology or molecular biology related work, and we'll discuss that why we have to wear the gloves and so on. And other personal protective equipment might be necessary depending on your job. For example, if you are going to do some kind of centrifugation, even in the BSL-1, in uh, Biosafety Laboratory 1, uh, level one, then uh, if you are going to do the center and there are chances that it can splash, then you can wear the personal protective equipment, like you can wear the goggles uh, to protect your eyes, or you can uh, have a face a shield in that case. So it it's actually depends on uh, what type of job you are going to do. Or if you have a frozen sample of, for example, if you are working on a plant 
and you have prepared the samples you have put those samples in liquid nitrogen and after that you are going to uh, use those samples and you are going to use a motor ampicil and you you are you want to grind those samples look if you have taken out those samples from the liquid nitrogen they will be even if they are they could be the liquid or if they are the leaf or uh, stem part they they will be very solid so if you are going to grind them they can actually during the grinding they can go into your eyes and they can damage the eyes so in that case you can uh, be at the safety goggles so this is also important that what kind of experiment you are going to do and that's why you have to prepare your mind and yourself that if you are going to do this kind of experiment then you have to take these kind of personal protective equipment and then you should have uh, uh, a, a jar or a basket uh, in which you can put the contaminated stuff that it is then a, a designated trash container should always be located near the exit to a lab uh, or facility so that possibly contaminated PPEs can be removed and disposed of before leaving the area. So whenever like you are going out of the laboratory after performing the experiment, a trash uh, bin should be there in the laboratory close to the door in which you can remove all your uh, disposable personal protective equipment and you can put into that trash and close it. So this is so, so that you can avoid the contamination of the whole area. Uh, it could be like, sometimes it's a common practice of the graduate students that they are wearing the lab coat and gloves and everything they, are, they have put on and they are walking in the corridor and that's, this is how they can spread the contamination. Uh, this is the wrong practice, we shouldn't do that. After complete, completion of the work, uh, you should remove all your personal, especially the disposable one, personal protective equipment, and you should put into the trash bin. And there is also a way to properly store those uh, contaminated uh, PPEs, and then uh, there is also a way of uh, disposal. There should be also be a place uh, to put non-disposable uh, PPEs, such as lab coats, for laundry. Uh, never take your lab coat home to wash it. Uh, like in, the, the, I was working in California or I was working in UAB, University of Alabama in Bingham. In those cases, there were specific designated uh, areas in which we used to hang our, uh, we, uh, we uh, usually write our name on our lab coat and then we, uh, we put those into those designated area. And there is a, some uh, staff actually, they, they handle it and they handle it in a proper way. They wash it, clean it, and then they put it back in, in a clean area where you can pick and then you can use it. So we sh this, this is a practice and this also should be practiced in, in, in developing countries that we shouldn't take the lab coat and other uh, non-disposable personal protective equipment. We shouldn't take those to the home. Because if we are going to take those to the home, we are can we can contaminate. Like if you are going to put into your purse or into your bag, you can can contaminate all your other items in in your bag, in your vehicle, and your family could be also at the risk. So uh, mm -hmm. this could possibly contaminate you, your clothes, your vehicle, your family, and other clothes in in washing machine. So uh, this is this shouldn't be the practice. And even if, like, if you want to take it, there is no facility of uh, proper laundering in your hospital settings or in your laboratory settings. What you can do, there are there are several alternatives, and one could be like you can uh, put your uh, non-disposable lab coat in in a, a plastic bag. You can uh, seal it, and you can autoclave it. And after after autoclaving it, if it is like microbiological contamination, then all the contaminants will be dead. And after that, you can take that. To the home and in in this case that's that's pretty safe now, otherwise like if you are just taking that to your home after like wearing it that that's a malpractice and we shouldn't do that and then there, there are disposable shoe covering our booties that we often use in our uh, hospital settings in our laboratory settings especially if we are uh, going to the animal house uh, disposable shoe covering our booties are required in all animal facilities area to protect research and prevent transmission of pathogens from one area to another area. So like if you are going to walk with a knockout mice or a knockout rabbit, for example, they are very precious 
animal and it takes years of research to create those output models. Uh, if you're working in a laboratory, uh, you are working with some other microorganisms and you are, or you are working, uh, you are going to the animal facility, you have those knockout to model animals. Uh, if you are going directly to that area, then with your shoes, you can take the contaminant to the animal facility and that contaminants, they can spread the disease to those uh, animals you are working with. So in this case, we can make them sick and we can lose those animals. And that's why you should put the shoe, uh, shoe coverings to protect those animals. And it's, it's also true, like otherwise, in, in a vice versa conditions, if you are going in animal facility and in an animal facility, you are working with specific microorganisms, for example, they have their own uh, microflora as well. So we can get those contaminants. They can be attached to our shoes and we can take those to the laboratories. And this is how we can spread those contamination to our experimental area. It shouldn't be the practice. What we should do uh, if we are going to the animal facility, before going to the animal facility, we should put on the disposable uh, shoe coverings or booties, and we can go to the animal facility. After going to the animal facility, when we move all from there, uh, we, we can remove those uh, booties or shoe covering and we can put into the, in the, into the disposable uh, the trash can. And this is how we can move on. And this is how we can protect the animals and we can also protect ourselves. Similarly, if you are going to the animal facility, we should also have the head coverings. Uh, this is also very important because uh, our head, they can also be loaded with microorganisms and we can spread those microorganisms. And similarly, the animal facility, they are also very rich in different kind of uh, microorganisms and we can carry those microorganisms and we can take to the other laboratory and we can contaminate our laboratory so this is very important and that we should know that what ppes are required while working in a animal house or animal facility or in a greenhouse for example if you're working there or if you are going to operation theater for example so we shouldn't carry the microorganisms from the streets or from the corridors and to the operation theater and similarly, we shouldn't carry the microorganisms which are in the operation theater outside to contaminate the whole facility. Lab coat is very important. We should always wear a clean button lab coat or disposable gown and appropriate gloves when working with hazardous material. Uh, why we should do that, I'm going to explain it. Lab coat or disposable gown act as a barrier between you and infectious substances, chemicals, hazardous base and flying objects. So they, they are actually a barrier. I should mention here as well, according to recent research published that uh, a healthy individual have around 30 trillion cells and the number of microorganisms that we harbor are even more. They are around 37 trillion microorganisms that we have in our body. So it's, it's actually the barrier is a two way protection. One way protection is we are protecting ourselves from the hazardous material, from the microorganisms. And on the other side, we are protecting our experimental objects. We are uh, protecting the animals. We are protecting our experiments from ourselves because we are also loaded with the uh, microorganisms. They are present on our skin. They can be like, we are dropping those micro. Even if we are talking, then we are uh, throwing thousands and millions of microorganisms into the air. And this is how we can also contaminate our experiment. This is, that's why we should wear the gloves and the mask and the button lab coat to protect ourselves and also to protect our experimentation and all experiments. So they help delay the transfer of hazardous material to your cloth and, and the skin and protect your clothes uh, from possible contamination protect lab equipment, materials, specimens, patients, and animals from, from contamination from you, and should remain in area where they are used. They shouldn't be worn outside the area, no matter where you are going, into a break room, from one building to another one, out, of, uh, out to lunch, or uh, when you are going home. This protects you and your co-workers, uh, your work and clothes from the possibility of contamination. So, uh, as we have explained that this is uh, important that we shouldn't take, uh, because when we are working in a laboratory, for example, we are working in a microbiological laboratory. Uh, while working in the laboratory, there are splashes and there are contaminants, they are all around us. 
and they can go to our lab coat. And if we are wearing those lab coat and we are going to the uh, administration buildings or we are going to the cafeteria, those loaded uh, cores will also will be a source of contamination everywhere. Whatever we touch, like we are, if we are going to touch a seat, we can spread the contamination there and so on. And so it's, it's important that we should keep those contaminated lab cores and cones into that specific area or in, in within the laboratory. We should hang those if, we, if they are not disposable. If they are disposable one, we can put into the trash can and uh, we, we can move out. Gloves, uh, they are, uh, we shouldn't like never put on or don gloves just because they are in the laboratory or are readily available read the label and determine if the gloves is best for you, the hazard that you are working with. So uh, first we have to check what uh, size of the gloves are needed in, on your hand. Not, normally in most of the laboratories, uh, there is a chart on which you can place your hand and it determines that what size of gloves is good for your hand. And there is like extra small, small, medium, large, or extra large, so it depends. And then you should wear the gloves that is according to your size. For example, if medium size fits on your hand. If you wear large one, it will not actually, you, you will lose your grip. And similarly, if uh, medium size is uh, good for you and you are going to wear the small one, it will torn out and it will not protect you. So first thing is you should determine that what size is good for you. And other thing is if you are going to work with different like uh, chemicals, with processes, with uh, molecular biology laboratory, or a microbiology laboratory, then you should know first that what type of gloves is good for you and then you should use that accordingly. Also, one type of glove doesn't work for all type of chemicals and the hazardous material. The following are example of different type of gloves and the hazard. So there are different type of gloves that we can use in the laboratory. For example, there is a natural rubber, PVC, nitrile, neoprene, and then PVC, cotton, wire mesh, and then welding, leather, anti-vibration. So there are different type of gloves and it depends on what type of job you are going. In most of the molecular biology laboratories or in microbiology laboratories, there are two type of gloves that we commonly use. And these are the latex and nitrile. The gloves shown on the left is made of latex. It is a basic type of rubber glove, good for wearing while working with some water-based chemical and or hazardous material. If you have an allergy to latex, you should use nitrile gloves. So latex are the commonly used in the laboratory. They are cheap, uh, but uh, they have some problems. Like some people have the allergy to the latex, so they shouldn't use those. The blue gloves on the right are nitrile gloves made of synthetic material. They contain no latex protein. They offer excellent resistance to punctures and tears. Nitrile gloves are three times more puncture resistant than rubber and can be used to offer superior resistance to many types of chemicals. So in most of the laboratories uh, we use, we prefer the nitrile gloves because they are more puncture resistant and uh, they protect your hand. So these are uh, the gloves. In addition, we sometimes use the leather gloves. They are most often found in construction areas and maybe cut resistant. They are useful when working with abrasive material. So in addition, like if you are going with the, the chemicals, the, the very strong, a kind of uh, chemicals. We use neoprene gloves. Neoprene gloves are made of from synthetic rubber that is highly liquid proof and chemical resistant. They are great for specialized chemical application involving acids, caustics, oils, alcohol, and solvents, but they are not very flexible. So we should remember that they are not very flexible and handy to work with these kind of things. So if you have to make them a bit handy, then we use butyl gloves. Butyl gloves are highly flexible and made from key rubber. They are useful for handling some type of strong corrosives, aces, or solvents. So if you have to deal these kind of stuff, then we use the butyl gloves. Then heat resistant gloves. This, this is also very good and they should be like present in all the microbiology or molecular biology laboratories because often we put the things to sterilize them in, in like a, in heat oven and that the temperature goes like 160 degrees Celsius or 180 degrees Celsius and we have to take out those uh, stuff after putting in, in, in those ovens 
And in that case, we should use the heat resistant gloves to protect our hands. In addition, sometimes like it's a common practice that if you have to prepare a gel uh, for DNA uh, kind of experimentation, then we put the buffer and the gel material and we use the microwave and we uh, just put in the microwave and then we heat it up and then we have to take out the flask from the microwave. In that case, we choose we should use the heat resistant gloves to protect our hands. I like, I have seen in some places that people normally move out those flaws using the tissue, tissue paper or with the piece of cloth. But in some cases that it can burn your hands. So it's, it's important that if you're dealing with the hot objects or if you are dealing with like this kind of experimentation, then you should wear the heat resistant gloves. Then there are also cryogenic gloves. Cryogenic gloves are required when handling liquid nitrogen. These liquid nitrogen are, if you have put the samples in minus 80, in that case, we should use the cryogenic gloves. These gloves usually have thermal protection built in since they are designed to work in ultra cold temperature. They can be water resistant or waterproof. So as I mentioned that if you are going to take out a sample, like in most of the molecular biology experimentation or microbiological experimentation, we put the samples in minus ATR in liquid nitrogen, and sometimes we have to take out those samples. And in that case, we if we open the facility of like minus 80 and we have to uh, search for the boxes, we have to move the boxes and then we have to search the samples. You can't hold those boxes with bare hands because it will be ultra cold and it can give you cold burns. Similarly, if you are going to take out the samples from the liquid nitrogen, which is ultra low temperature of minus 192 degrees Celsius, that's super cold. And if you put some, your hand in, into that, although it's a liquid, if you put your hand and it will give you cold burn. So to avoid that, we should use the cryogenic gloves and they are very important. And uh, like in most of the developed countries, these are available in all the laboratories, but in most of the developing countries, uh, they should have these gloves uh, because I have seen uh, people working in uh, with minus 80 uh, degrees Celsius, they are taking out the sample. They put a box, take it the box and then put it at the side and then they are rubbing their hand to warm them up. And then they are going to pick another box. And this is the factor you see often. So in order to avoid this practice, what we can do, we can use the cryogenic gloves and they are good for you, good for your health, good for your hands. Uh, and to avoid the uh, cold injury and cold shock. Then it's uh, also very important to safely move the gloves. It's uh, like gloves are the things which are more contaminated while working in the laboratory. So you should also learn that how you can uh, remove the gloves. So both, if you have put on your gloves on both of the hands, if you will remove those, then you should work in a way as it is uh, described here that you shouldn't touch the, your skin. You can remove uh, one glove uh, by like uh, pulling it from the glove stop and you have another gloves on your uh, on, on another hand and you can remove that and from that you can pick the other one. This is like the, as it is dis described over here. So th this also needed practice and as our hands, they are more contaminated with the uh, chemicals or with the microbiological agents, it's very important that we should learn that how we can safely remove the gloves. This is a very important practice and it needs practice to do that. Uh, the key point here is that you shouldn't touch your skin uh, with the contaminated gloves, but you can actually use the inside of the gloves because that's outside is contaminated, inside is in touch with you and that is not contaminated. So you can either use from inside or you can uh, hold the one contaminated from the contaminated one and you can remove that. Washing your hand is very, very important practice. Uh, is if you are working in a hospital setting, if you are working in a laboratory, this is the very and most important practice that you can do to protect yourself, your family and the environment because hands are the most contaminated things and, and the, that will be more uh, contaminated and this is this is why uh, you should learn the proper way of uh, decontaminating your hands. Always wash your hands after uh, docking your gloves. Washing your hands eliminate most contaminants. So uh, either like if you are if 
there is a water, you can wash your hands, or if there is a, a liquid based uh, uh, antiseptic, you can use the uh, hand sanitizer, you can use those as well. So, this is a, a diagram in which I, I demonstrate the key steps uh, which we have, what we have to do uh, to wash our hands. Uh, and as it is described over here, the first step is wet your hands and then put on your soap. It is a, is a liquid soap or a solid one. You should put it on and then uh, scrub it for around 20 seconds properly so it makes the foam. And then you have to wash the whole hand, like all the areas which could be, uh, the can, like some of the areas which are, normally if we wash the hands, they are missed. So we, we shouldn't miss those. Uh, areas. For example, uh, this is the area between our fingers that we shouldn't miss that from the back side and the front from the front side, and then the area between our finger and the thumb. So we should it, wash it also very carefully on the both sides, and the fingertips. We should also rub it uh, on in the palm of the hands. So this is how we can decontaminate all the area. So. There is a proper practice of washing hands. Uh, I have uh, some other videos on the YouTube in which uh, uh, I have described, I have uh, demonstrated uh, that how we have to wash our hands properly. And you can wash, uh, watch those videos as well. So then we have to rinse it for around 10 seconds and then we have to turn off the tap and then we have to dry our hands. So this is the practice that we use. And this is very important practice and it should be a practice for all the people who are working in the lavatory that whenever you move out from the lavatory, you should wash your hands in a, in a proper way to remove 99.9% germs from your hand. Because if you are working, for example, with some of the bacteria like Salmonella, Shigella, uh, they, are, they can cause the diarrhea and uh, even very, very low number of these microorganisms uh, they can cause the disease. So if you are working in a microbiological laboratory and you are working with these microorganisms and you have contaminated your hand, after that you move up to the laboratory and then you touch different surfaces, the person who will also touch those surfaces, they can also have the contaminants on their hand. And if they eat something, they, that contamination go into the digestive system and they can cause the disease. Similarly, like if, if, if it is different scenario and you are going out with contaminated hands and somebody offer you food, you pick that food and you eat it, you will have the contaminants. They are going into the, your digestive system and they can cause it. And in the present scenario that we have learned from the COVID-19 that hands are very important and to wash properly whenever we go out into the markets, uh, we can contaminate our hands with the coronavirus and we should wash it properly while moving back to our home so that we can protect ourselves and our family members. So washing hand is very, very important practice and you should do it properly. As I mentioned that we shouldn't leave any part of our hands uh, with the contaminants. We should wash it properly and this, this should be the practice. And as, I, as it is demonstrated in, in this image as well, uh, we should do it properly. And don't forget to wash between your fingers, under your nails, and top of your hands, the top side of your hand. This is also important to wash properly. Then there is uh, eye protection. For eye protection, we can use goggles, we can use safety glasses, and face shield. As you mentioned uh, in, in the start that in some of the experiments, if, we, if there are chances of splash, then we should wear proper goggles as the safety glasses so we can protect our eyes. Eyes are very important. And if we are using these kind of glasses, uh, so they will not give you full protection because the contaminants, the splash can go uh, into our eye from here, uh, from the side, and they can go into our eyes and they can damage our eyes. So in that case, there are some specific uh, safety goggles uh, that we can use in our laboratories, just like this. This is a one example, we can put it on our uh, glasses or we can remove the glasses and we can use these if your eyesight is like so then you can perform the experimentation. So in this case, you can see it truly covers your eyes. So in this case, all, the whole eye will be protected and there is no chances that the splash can go directly into the eye, the particle can go directly into your eyes. 
in addition uh, the, some glasses they are like if you are working with uh, some uh, you, uh, you you are working with dna or rna and in some cases we just want to see whether uh, there is a band of dna uh, using like a, we we often stain the dna or rna with ethidium bromide and we stain it and then we put on the uv lamp and then we see whether there is a like expression of the genes or if there is a dna or rna there and in that case we just put it on and just turn it on and see so this type of uh, goggles we can also use in that case because this is polycarbon and this is uh, uh, the uv light uh, it doesn't pass from these uh, glasses so in this case your eyes will be protected like in most of the case we are uh, we take the images in proper settings uh, with the camera and a closed system but in some cases like if we are doing just we are going to check whether there is expression of some genes or not using the dna gel then we can use these kind of uh, goggles and these kind of glasses and we can protect our eyes from ultraviolet light so this is also important that we should have proper eye protection in this. so there are a variety of different uh, kind of uh, uh, goggles and safety glasses and faces that we can use in the laboratory to protect our eyes. Then respiratory protection is also very, very important. In, uh, like in the basic laboratory, if we are using, uh, like if we are going to prepare the chemicals, uh, just like I have mentioned that you are going even uh, going to prepare a buffer and you are going to use the SDS or you are using different other chemicals. In that case, we should wear a simple mask uh, to have the respiratory protection. So in this case, we can just have a simple mask that we uh, are now common, everybody is using this. So simple mask, this, this can protect us from those like chemicals. So in this case, uh, we can use it and then we should uh, like do the experiment. Like if you are going to weigh some chemicals or if you are working in uh, biosafety level one or biosafety level two laboratory, okay, if you are going to do some uh, PCR based work, then we can use simple mask so simple mask but why we have to do that uh, because it protect our experiment it's not only the protection of ourselves as i mentioned in the start it also protect our experiments because if you are talking or if you are breathing then we are also throwing thousands of microorganisms and they can go into your pcr tube and the result could be positive or result could be negative so in order to uh, avoid that we should have the respiratory protection in addition, if you are going to work in a biosafety level three laboratory, uh, in which there are chances of aerosol transmission, then you, you should wear a N95 mask. And there is also a proper way of wearing the N95 mask. I was like, I was involved in different trainings. I, I've been to uh, around 100 universities and institutes to give a training to the researchers about uh, donning and doffing of personal protective equipment. At the very start, when we used to give the like training to our young researchers and medical professionals. Then we used to give them, everybody to the N95 mask. And we, when we used to give them, they were unable to put on. The donning was very difficult for them and even the doffing. And they even break the strips of these N95 masks. So that's why it's very important that if you have to have the proper protection, if you are going to work, for example, if in your experiment, you are going to work with, uh, uh, with the aerosol-based transmission, or if you are going to see a patient who is suffering from coronavirus, for example, coronavirus is a buzz thing these days. So if you are going to visit uh, or inspecting a person, uh, if you are a physician that is suffering from coronavirus, in that case, you should have N95 mask. Or if you are working in a biosafety level three laboratory, where there is a chances of uh, are you working with uh, for example tuberculosis uh, in that case they, there is chances of aerosol transmission and in that case you can't use simple mask uh, and you should have n95 mask in that case so to so that you can protect yourself and there is a proper way of donning and doffing it so you should learn that as well that this is how uh, simply if i have demonstrate for you like if you have to wear a N95 mask, then the, the best practice is like you put your hand just like this and put into your nose and then you take the upper strip and put in here just like this and then you take an, the lower strip and 
it goes to the back side and similarly so and then you have to put on your nose and this is how you have to properly wear it and if you have to remove it simply you can take the lower stripper and then you take the upper strip and simply you can just remove it so it's, it's very simple but as you mentioned that if you don't have the training of using the personal protective equipments then uh, you will not protect yourself and it's like uh, even during the donning and doffing you will break the strips or you will not put the metal properly on your nose then there are chances of leakage and you can get the uh, like disease so it's very important that you should have the proper training of donning and doffing of your personal protective equipments so if you have any question uh, like if you want uh, being a student if you want me to demonstrate some other personal protective equipments like how we have to use the goggles or the face shield or other masks, I can also do that. So if you can <clears throat> ask me the question, my email address is given or you can ask uh, on the course website, uh, you can ask the question and I will demonstrate for you that how you have to do it. The respiratory protection is very important as uh, I mentioned in the very start that you should uh, work, like you should know the risks first. Like if you are going to work in a, uh, biosafety level three laboratory. In biosafety level four laboratory, we are not using these kind of masks. In that case, we should uh, use the respirators in, uh, with the proper car system and with the positive pressure suit and so on. So th that's a different kind of uh, setup. But in most of the laboratories, like we are working in biosafety uh, level one, level two, or level three laboratories, if you are going to work in a biosafety level three laboratory, as you mentioned, you should wear the N95 mask. If you are going to work in a biosafety level one laboratory, there is no need of N95 mask. So you can use a simple mask if it is required. So you should know the risk first and accordingly, uh, you should use the personal protective equipment. So first thing is to calculate the risk. What are the risks? Even if you are going to do the DNA extraction or the RNA extraction, you should know what chemicals you are dealing with. If you are going to extract the DNA or RNA from a pathogenic microorganisms or not, if you are going to extract from the pathogen, uh, then you have to take extra personal protective equipment. If you are just going to extract the DNA from the animal cells, for example, then you're, you don't need those kind of personal protective equipment. But for the chemicals, you need those specific uh, personal protective equipment. So it it's very much depends on the experiment you are going to do. So it's very important, I, I should mention it again, that what kind of experiments you are going to do. And accordingly, first you should calculate the risk that these could be the risks during the experimentation. And you have to minimize those risks uh, by using your personal protective equipment that how you can protect yourself in that case. So if you are, uh, so it's important that you should wear the proper uh, personal protective equipment. So there are different type of respiratory uh, protection like air uh, purifying there are gas masks that depends on uh, if you are working in, in some chemical facility then there are full face masks and disposable filter and half masks that you can use and then if like if you are working in some other facility for example if you are going to work uh, in a level four facility then there is there is an airline and there is a spied air that you should take uh, you, you don't have to breathe in the laboratory if you are going to work in a level four laboratory, then you should uh, have the air line and you breathe using the air line. And there is also the different type like you can put on the cylinder and then you can breathe that. So there are different air lines and air treatment. It depends on what kind of experiments or what time, kind of facility you are going to join. Sometimes we need the hearing protection. Noise is not a new hazard. Too much noise exposure may cause a temporary change in hearing. Your ears may feel stuffed up or a temporary ringing in your ears. So that, that, that's a common problem that we can face. These short-term problems usually go away within a few minutes or hours after leaving noise. However, repeated exposure to loud noise can lead to permanent uh, problem in your ear. Tinnitus or noise-induced hearing loss. When noise levels are above 80 decibels, people have to speak very loudly. And when noise levels are between 80 to 90 decibels, people have to show. So sometimes, if, even if like we are uh, working in a molecular biology laboratory, 
uh, then we have to, uh, in some of the experiments, we have to lyse the cells and we use the sonication. Sonication is a you know, experiment which produce a very piercing sort of sound. And after doing the sonication, uh, you feel like ringing in your ear. So in that case, you, you can use the hearing protection or in some laboratory, if there is a lot of noise and then you, you should use the hearing protection. When noise levels are greater than 90 decibel, people have to move closer, close together to hear each other and speak loudly. If the noise is prolonged or you must show to be heard, you may want to ask your supervisor or manager about ear protection. There are two types to choose from, the ear muff or soft internal plugs. So we can use the ear muffs that we have often seen like on the airport that the people who are you know, working on the air force and uh, at the cargo areas and some other uh, area with loud noise they are using the muffs or we can use the ear plugs in that case. Long hair, uh, long loosey hair could easily be caught in machinery. They could be contaminated by chemicals, radioactive or infectious substances or catch fire near our uh, an open frame. Recently, a year student died when her hair caught in the lavatory machine. So for the details, you can check from the link. So this is also a common problem that you should, if you are working in a lavatory, it's, it's better to uh, uh, not work with the open hairs because if, if they will be open, then they also, they are like with charge. So they attract the charged particles and mostly the particles, they are the charged ones. So they can go in and entangle in your hairs and they can spread the contamination. So in that case, we can use the hair covering. Uh, and the hair covering, as we mentioned that if you are working in the operation theater or if you are going to the animal facility, animal house, or if you are working in a plant greenhouse, for example, in that case, we should have the, uh, the hair protection as well, the hair coverings that we can use. Uh, so we can protect our hairs from the contaminants and also contaminants should go from our hairs to, to those areas. So these, these uh, are you know, very important that we should know what kind of personal protection is needed in our experiments and how we have to protect. So uh, if I if briefly, uh, I will give the summary just the last slide, is wearing and applying cosmetics in the laboratory. So uh, you may wear cosmetics, including lip balm inside the lab or in area where hazardous material and chemical are related. However, you may not apply them inside the lab or area. Applying cosmetics, even lip balm in the lab or in or an area where hazardous materials are used could pick up particles and get, and get in your system, mostly in the digestive system, by directly entering your mouth. So in that case, it's, it's recommended that uh, if you are wearing the jewelry, for example, like the rings or the bangles, or some other we should remove while working in the laboratory because if we have wear the jewelry like the rings, for example, we can wear the uh, the gloves in a proper way and they mostly torn up if we are wearing the rings and so on. So jewelry we shouldn't, uh, it's better, it's recommended that we shouldn't use in the laboratory and we shouldn't use the cosmetics in the laboratory. That's also very important. So because they, they uh, promote the uh, chances of getting the infectious material into the digestive system. So once again, uh, while starting both, you should know the hazardous material around, what steps you are going to do, what hazards are involved, and what personal protective equipments are needed for your experiment. So you have to check uh, everything first uh, to protect yourself, your colleagues, your family, and the environment, and then you should start your work. For example, if you are going to work in a in a laboratory and you are going to do the PCR for coronavirus or if you are going to do the PCR for uh, the TB, tuberculosis. So in that case, they, they are chances of uh, respiratory, uh, they can go into the respiratory system and can, can cause infection. So in that case, uh, you should know that uh, what type of protection are needed. Do you have the proper respiratory protection or not? If there is no proper respiratory protection, you are at greater risk and you can catch the infection. So that that's, you should avoid. So before starting your work, you should know that whether there is a proper protection for my respiratory system, for my digestive system, for my eyes, for my skin, for my hearing and so on. 
and all these PPEs are available or not. If they are not available, you shouldn't take the risk and you should arrange your personal protective equipments and then you should start work in the laboratory. So uh, you should uh, be aware of all the personal protection, what PPEs are there. You should know how the there is a proper way of donning and doffing, but what should be done first, what should be done first. Donning and doffing is also very important. Like if you are working in a fire safety level three and you have a uh, don or a lab coat or a suit that you have to wear uh, on your whole uh, skin. And if you are wearing a suit and then you have to wear a respirator and the safety goggles and booties and head covers and so on. So you should know what how you have to uh, don all these PPEs. And then after completing experimentation, you should know what is the most mostly contaminated and how you have to do the doffing. For example, if you have worked in a biosafety level three laboratory, you have a suit, you have the goggles, you have the respiratory protection and then different masks. And then what you have to remove first? This is a question. So is what should be the more contaminated? It should be the gloves. So you have to remove in, in those cases, we mostly, what we do, we use double pair of gloves. So we have the first pair of gloves and then we have another pair of gloves. So after experimentation, the upper pair uh, will be more contaminated. So we remove that. And then we remove the respirator and the goggles and ultimately we remove the suit. So this is, this is the exercise that we, you should do while starting working in the laboratory that what you should wear first and what you should remove first and then go on. First aid boxes, they are very important in the laboratory. Uh, like in if there is some, any emergency condition, there should be a first aid box that should be there in the laboratory. And uh, so that you can have the first aid and there should be some people in the laboratory, they should have the training of first aid so they can give you the first aid. Uh, because in some cases, if you have the like a fever or it says, a pain in the muscles, for example, if there is a cut or if you get a burn, then you should uh, know what we have to do first. Because reaching the, uh, to the uh, like hospital may take one hour or 30 minutes and so on. And in that case, the condition can get worse. So if like there is any uh, cut on your skin, or if you get a burn by the Benson burner or some other place, then you should know that uh, the, first, uh, the first aid box is there in the laboratory and you, you can use those first aid. Uh, in addition, it's also important that you should check the medicine in the first aid box that they shouldn't be expired. We should also regularly check those and the lab manager should check those that, that the medicine and other stuff is not expired and everything is available. Normally what we should have in the first aid box is the, the cotton and the bandage, a scissor, bandage, thermometer, muscle rub, ointment, disposable gloves, tweezer, antiseptic liquid, painkiller, and antihistamine. So if you are allergic, you can use antihistamine. If you have a pain, you can use a painkiller. And then antiseptic liquid should be there. If there is a wound, you can please clean that and so on. So there should be proper training. And if there is not a box in your laboratory, you should ask your manager to arrange a first aid box because this is a must item in the laboratory and it should be there in the laboratory. The first aid box should be there. And I remember my experience that when I started working in the United States back in 2008, uh, when I, on the very first day, when I went to the Institute, my supervisor uh, took me, uh, he, we took it around and the first place we went uh, in, in our Institute was the place where there was a first aid box. So he took me initially to the place where there was a first aid box and he showed me that this is the first aid box. If there is any emergency condition, you should come here or you should ask somebody to bring something for you. And this is the first aid box. Uh, you should visit if there is like some problem. So first aid box is very important for your institute, for your laboratory. If it is a microbiology, molecular biology, a chemical laboratory, it should be there in all the laboratories. And uh, it, like, the practice we used to, the trainings we were doing in, in some of the developing countries, we used to take the first aid boxes to the laboratories and we used to donate them so they, they can start the practice of having the first aid boxes 
in the laboratories. So uh, with this, uh, I conclude my this uh, course about the personal protective equipment. Uh, I'm very hopeful that you, sh you will have a better understanding about the personal protective PPEs, but PPEs are needed. If you are working in a simple laboratory of a safety level one, that we should need a, a gown or a lab coat, gloves. And if you are going to work in a biosafety lab street through, then you are going to deal with the pathogen. So you have to have the respiratory protection and so on. And the lab coat and the gloves, they are, they must go in all the laboratory settings that you should have. They are the most requirement. They are the basic requirement that you should have in the laboratories. So what we have to do finally, we have to protect our respiratory system. They are mostly, we get the problem to our skin or our respiratory protection. So mainly we have to protect our skin and the respiratory system. And we also have to protect our digestive system, our eyes, our hearing, our hair, and so on. So, and for all these, there are PPEs and they should be there while working in the laboratory. Uh, first, you have to know the risk. What are the risks involved in those experimentation? Whatever experiment you are going to do, uh, you should know the risk involved and how you can use those uh, personal protective equipment. Are they there in the laboratory? And how you can properly don those PPEs, how you can dock those PPEs. Uh, there should be proper training by, uh, before starting your experiments. And then you can complete those uh, experiments and then uh, you will be safe. So this is very important practice uh, that we should have the proper training of uh, all the uh, personal protection uh, we should have. Uh, and uh, this is important for ourselves, for our safety, for the safety of our all the colleagues, for the management of the institute and for the environment. And before starting you know, your lab work, you should know uh, the you should go through a course about the biosafety. We have recently uh, published a book about the uh, biosafety uh, that will also be available. We are going to make it available online as well. So you can also download and read that. We also have printed the copies of the book. So uh, you can also get the printed one. And uh, that's, that's mainly about the biosafety levels and how you have to work in those conditions. But this course is mainly focused about, and this lecture is mainly focused about the personal protective equipment, that what equipment are needed and how you have to don it and how you have to stop it. So uh, hopefully uh, this will uh, increase your understanding that why we have to wear the gloves, for example, how we have to wash our hands, and how we have to uh, make the respiratory protection, eye protection, hearing protection, and so on. So thank you very much for joining the course and for your listening.